to start it, uh, I'd like to, to tell some things uh, to the particip participants. Uh, Johannes already tell you some. Uh, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, I would like to ask you about to, to turn off your video, but I think Adriana would like to see some people, so it's good to, it's okay <laughs> if you, someone wants to, to leave the camera on. Um, the session is being recorded, uh, like uh, Johannes told you. Uh, feel free to make questions, comments, uh, use the chat box on the right. Most of the people have the chat box on the right, okay. Um, what else? Uh, the questions, Professor Adriana, I'm going to, to ask you, okay? Uh, just let me know when you want to know about the questions. If you want the questions during your presentation or after the presentation, just let me know, okay? Um, don't ask, don't, please don't, don't type the question for the, the speaker because she's going to be uh, uh, speaking and it's difficult to stop to read the chat. So that's why I'm going to read the questions for her. Um, if you have any problems, any technical issues, you can talk to Julio. Actually, he's using a, a, a account of Jaspal, if you can see it. If you have any problems, you can talk with Julio, okay? Um, it's up to you, Professor. I'll just say a few words to introduce Adriana. Yeah. Um, Adriana was born in Chile and has been a professor um, in linguistics in Venezuela for a long time. Uh, she's currently living in Mexico uh, for reasons which we can all well imagine. Um, we met in Santo Domingo in December, which was a great pleasure. And I'm very glad not only to see Adriana, but uh, other colleagues uh, from, from that very nice event, uh, Marta and Nuria. And uh, I think there's some others as well. Uh, it's really great to see you here. And um, um, we founded uh, that uh, series um, to make possible those exchanges. And it's great that uh, among the many very positive effects of coronavirus, one of them is that we can have these um, uh, talks now all together online um, even more easily than before. And that's really great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Adriana has, um, has a long um, history of working with colleagues in the UK. Um, you did your master's in uh, London, um, you did your um, PhD in Birmingham, um, and um, so you're, I mean, definitely a natural candidate for the London Open Discourse Net Seminar, and uh, we're very glad to have you here as uh, one of our first uh, speakers. Um, you were the founder of ALED, um, La Asociación Latinoamericana de Estudios del Discurso. And you've also been, uh, you were also um, the chief editor of um, the Revista ALED, uh, the, uh, the journal of um, that Latin American Association, uh, which is a, a very important uh, uh, journal um, uh, for, for Latin American discourse studies. And um, so we're very pleased and also very much honored um, to see you here in our Open uh, Discourse Net London seminar. And uh, yeah, your talk will be about uh, your current research um, around um, discourse and emotions. And we're very much uh, um, looking forward to it. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. So now do I have to silence my, my... No? No, you don't have to no, no, silence okay. yourself. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, it's the others, it's the others, it's the others. Sorry, sorry. Well, thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really very happy, very pleased to be invited. Uh, I, I think I don't have much time, although I've got lots of, of material. So I will uh, go straight to the point. And this presentation was uh, done in Spanish before in Santo Domingo, where we met. And I've made some adjustments to it, okay? So emotions and ideology. It's, um, and I want to start with this, with this photo that was sent to me by a colleague in Chile when uh, there were these problems in October uh, last year, or the, yes, last year, October. And you say, tengo miedo, tengo rabia. I, this was a photo during the protests and someone wrote this, tengo miedo, tengo rabia meaning I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm scared, but I'm also angry. And see that this miedo is crossed out. So like, you know, what, am, what do I feel? 
And this I found very interesting because they are basic emotions and they are the emotions that are all over the world at the moment. But this was a photo in Chile. And okay, I'll go back to it later, okay? So um, what's the problem when we study emotions? And the main question is how to analyze emotion and their relation with ideologies in political change. What are we going to do? How do they work in political interaction? How do they shape the political dialogue? So these are the three, let's say, one of the main questions that sort of lead my research. And I must tell you, though, that uh, I've, I've got interested in, in emotions lately, although I've been analyzing political discourse for many years, but I think that it's time to give uh, emotions uh, more attention. And the study of emotions really is quite complex because it, it's, it's approached from so many perspectives that it would be impossible to study them all. So we have to choose. We don't normally choose or combine. So from philosophy, we have Socrates, Socrates, Aristotle, Platon, Stoics, Descartes, some words are in Spanish, okay? Uh, we have evolutionism, we have Charles Darwin. Imagine how, how you know, uh, present Charles Darwin is at the moment with the study of facial expressions. He was the first to study emotions in animals and humans and, and to see the social function of emotions. Uh, look at the psychophysiological view, William James, situation, reaction, the emotional experience, or behaviorism, Watson, Skinner, cognitivism, uh, Arnold, Freud, emotional intelligence, Garner, uh, Mayer, Coleman. Now the technology of emotions, Ekman, Pukovi, measurement, the, the, the emotional uh, lab, um, political emotions, another field. But the field we are interested in as discourse analysts is this one, the last one, that is oh, oh, oh. emotions, language and discourse. I mean, how emotions are studied in linguistics, the whole tradition, and in discourse. And this is done in France, in Britain, everywhere, in French, in Spanish. Mm. So this is just to see how complex it is. So what we do, what, what, what we see, how we see them from discourse, from language and discourse, that's the main point. The point is that all emotions materialize in language and all emotions can be studied linguistically. So we see the grammar, the lexis, semantics, pragmatics, and they can be studied rhetorically, interdisciplinary perspectives, psychology and semiotics, and we can see a vocabulary of emotions, a grammar of emotions, or a rhetoric of passions as social practice. So it is, this is the area where we as discourse analysts. Now, what is the connection between emotions and politics? That's another important point, because to understand emotions means to understand how they influence the behavior of social actors in general, and in particular, the behavior of political leaders that discursively shape social interaction and political change. Emotions in politics as public discourse have a cognitive, interactional, evaluative, and ideological function. That's what I think. <coughs> Sorry. Why? Because they move events, emotions move events from the perspective of the participants in the political interactions, the leaders, the common people, the media, internet users, according to their own state of knowledge and representations of the world. Emotions contribute to the control of political power and they are manipulated through the media with political aims. So there is, you know, plenty of reasons, <coughs> sorry, plenty of reasons to, <coughs> to study emotions. Now, if we look at emotions and politics, but if we go on emotions and argumentation, that's another field. Okay, where the, 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 the problem between rationality and affectivity is discussed, okay. The logos and the pathos are linked to persuasion, says Fuss Amasi. But then there are too many, too, too important questions in relation to emotions and argumentation. <coughs> How do feelings interfere with argumentative interaction? To what extent are they compatible with rationality? And there are two positions. The moderate one, you know, Walton, emotions have a legitimate place in persuasive dialogue, 
but be careful, they may, they may be treated as fallacies. Or the fortis, though itself, uh, thought itself is passional, this is for the, the strong position, rationality is necessarily affective and, a cor and as a corollary, there is rationality of emotions. So feeling and reason coexist in argumentative interaction. So there's a whole literature on this. Excuse me. <coughs> so we go just looking, just looking at, at you know, the at theoretical bits. Okay. So then, um, the problem with emotions, if we put emotions in the center, is that they can be approached from all these perspectives, from each one of these from phonology, from morphology, from syntax, from semantics, from pragmatics, from conversational analysis, sociolinguistics, discourse analysis, critical analysis, cognition, semiotics, from education and from the new technologies. So it's a wide, very, very wide field. So what we have to do? Well, we have to make decisions about how we're going to study them. So my assumptions are <laughs> the following, how I see them. <clears throat> Emotions constitute a particular type of evaluation in political discourse. A study of evaluation. That means we need a theory of evaluation. What are we going to do? How are we going to study evaluation? Then we need the parameters for measuring the intensity of the emotions. And I think they are found in the event and in the political culture. So we have, it's not just studying political discourse, we have to study political cultures. So we need theories of context, history and culture. Now emotions have cognitive effects. They blur our reason, they drive you mad, they make you sick, they can kill you. So we need other disciplines, mainly psychology and medicine. Now, em emotions have strategic functions in communication. They seduce, they induce to, they persuade, they convince. So we need rhetoric, argumentation, and we need discourse. But that is not all, that is not all. We need to look at emotions from their strategic point of view, because they have strategic political functions that manipulation, polarization, domination, resistance, convivence, social harmony. So what theories we need? We need discourse analysis, we need dialogue analysis, and we need impolyness theories. I said impolyness rather than politeness. <laughs> so we, we need to go into, into social, social cultural pragmatics, definitely. And then emotions have ideological functions. Why? Emotions force us to have particular representations of what, of what politics is, and they make us uh, find a place in a political space to the right, to the left, in democracy, socialism, communism, dictatorship, or whatever. So we necessarily need to go to critical discourse study and do a political communication. So far, I am only with it. Now, if we go deeper into emotions and evaluation, then we have other options. We can study them linguistically, the expression of subjectivity in language, Kier Pratt, uh, Eric Yoni, Catherine has a very good, uh, a very good review of that in 2000. Or we go to appraisal theory, which is so much in fashion now, Martin and White, and this, we study affect. But that is discourse semantics, okay? Discursive semantics. Now, if we want to go to interactional analysis, we go to another option, affective bonding, which is interactional and which is positive or negative. You know, uh, you, you, you do create positive attachments or negative attachments. So in, the, in conflictive dialogue, you do have a bonding, but it's negative, that's all. And then we have to study evaluation in political dialogue, not only in, in, in situations, micro situations, but also in macro interactions. And I shall continue with that later. Okay. So this is, um, to me, evaluation is one of the central notions. So this is it. Now, Expressions are, are, are dis uh, emotions are expressed discursively. Yes. Okay. And uh, in language, the way they materialize, they explicit express, I'm scared, I'm angry. They are interpreted or inferred, they are unhappy. They are attributed, and this is a very good strategy in political discourse because, you know, <laughs> contenders always attribute emotions to others, how they feel. They are evoked, they are narrated, they are mediated, reported, quoted, or whatever. Uh, I Plantain has done this, and I've also done it in, in Venezuelan political discourse. 
for, for identifying different types of dialogue. Okay. Now, whose perspective? That's the other question. And what? What am I going to analyze? Whose perspective? Well, obviously, it's the perspective of the analyst, but it's also the perspective of this, the political actors, the people, the leaders, the media. And so in order to, to show or to see or explore how I've been doing this, I'm going to focus on three cases. Uh, the emotional outburst in Chile, October 2019, it was called La Crisis Emocional. When I looked up this word in, in Google, I found over 5 million results. Crisis Emocional in Chile, over 5 million results, which I compared with Venezuela, which I thought was in a very big emotional crisis. Venezuela had only 3, 000, 3 million at that moment. So it was a real emotional outburst. Now, the Bolivarian Revolution will be the focus. And this is to show how emotions uh, contribute to political change. Okay, this is, uh, Chile is the outburst. Okay, the main problem, how to look at it. But the revolution is how emotion changed the whole picture of politics. And the coronavirus as felt in Mexico, because I live in Mexico and these are my three countries. <laughs> um, I want to just explore because I haven't really done um, analysis as, as I've done with the others, but uh, I think there are important things that are different and I would like to point out that that's it. Okay, so how do I go about analyzing emotions in political dialogue? This is a summary, okay. Uh, of, uh, I do it from linguistics because I'm a linguist and, and I follow the, the British tradition, so you know what that is. I do I apply conversational analysis because that's where identities are built. I do social cultural pragmatics because it is very important to study interpersonal relations and, and, and the image, you know, the image, mainly that identity image, the problem of image. And I do macro dialogue, I mean, situated um, events or macro dialogue that is a long time. So there is a, a, a diachronic perspective here and, and here, diachronic, and uh, where history is very important. And I look at that synchronically as yes, text and, and, and genre. And obviously I have to look at political theory in order to understand concepts that we linguists do not handle because we are not experts in those things, you know, such as what is a democracy? When is a democracy no longer a democracy? Those sorts of things, you know? And, and I think that is the main picture okay and uh, uh, I I do look I have looked at, at the pronouns because they are signals of identity obviously group identity individual identity uh, but I do have here I have a difference with current uh, critical discourse analysts like for example Van Dijk or Van Dijk Fairclough or Bodak uh, they focus mainly on representations I believe that we have to focus on dialogue so normally when when you do ideological discourse analysis people said it's the us versus we or we, we and, and us and them us and them well I believe in Latin America at least or wherever there are authoritarian governments we need to focus on the I and the we I and the you because the eye of the leader the populist leader and you the people you my people because not everybody form parts of the people there are other people who are the enemies so in this populist triangle you have the leader okay you have the enemies you have the people and the enemies of the people so it, it is very important to look at the pronouns like that uh, i think that uh, this is in my studies on political on political pronouns i think i've shown that and um, well how do i read this dialogue okay and here i i I look at, at, at emotions in a continuum between the micro and the macro and dialogue for me is a condition for democracy with participation accessibility and it's 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 another major category because it's the right to refute it's a human right dialogue is a human right so this is just only you know to introduce all, some of the theoretical things and also we don't read don't don't read polit politics we we read I think political cultures and they are, highly, uh, they are uh, either inclined to dialogue or to no dialogue, either to solve the conflicts or they go on a search for conflict. So there is this continuum of democracy between democracy and authoritarianism. Or as we have now, if you see what the book just published in Stockholm by uh, Sulander, the Ron Paul group, 
uh, I mean, so we, we have a policies of extremes. You are either right or left. No? I mean, we are in a very extreme positions in, in the world. Okay. Okay. Now, so we, let's go to Chile. Let's go to Chile. Tengo rabia, tengo miedo. What happened in Chile? Uh, Chile is a relatively small country, long and skinny. It's 27 million people. And uh, there was this protest in, in December, which started with only uh, raising the fare, in the metro fare, but it extended to the whole country and there were very violent protests. And you are informed about that. Now, I, on the basis of a small corpus of images and articles, which I obtained through a friend of mine, Dr. Arancivia in Chile, these are her photos that she shared with me because she thought I might be able to do something with them. <laughs> And so you see, tengo miedo, tengo rabia, emotions are expressed, okay? But there's always a dialogue of, of someone in the collective who rescues that and, and sends messages. The pacos are the military, assassinos is murders, and pedophiles is, is the, the, the owners of this university, mainly the, the Catholic university, which is private and, and presumably rich. Okay, so there are, um, more of these, oh. you know, uh, they closed, I mean, every, everything closed and so and, until life is worth living, that, that's translated. So there are messages, all sorts of messages that show uh, a new constitution or nothing and uh, lots of, you know, reactions, uh, petitions to the president resigned. Uh, well, etc. I don't. I, these are the two precedents. I also uh, give a lot of attention to the participants. I mean, the responsible people, those who are responsible for moving the events. Uh, Piñera was the president then, and and she is Michelle Bachelet. She had been president twice. I mean, she represents the left. He represents the right wing, and they were both uh, seen as responsible for all this. Now. Um, I examined the visual metaphors. This was the image most seen and published everywhere in Chile. And look at it in the center, it, it's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. You have a general, General Baquedano, who was the hero, named uh, hero. And this is a square where um, protests normally take place. But the interesting thing is how all these symbols are used. You know, the, the, the flag on top is a Mapuche flag you know, defending uh, the, the discriminated ones and the Chilean flag, and you have men and women, and in, and in the background you have the cities burning. Actually, there was a lot of destruction. Uh, metro, stations, supermarkets, every, uh, buildings, uh, and it was really, really terrible. Now, that image was sent to a newspaper, was taken by an actress, a TV actress, Send it to the paper, and obviously the paper converted it into a great spectacle, you know, it's a spectacular thing. Now, also, I examined uh, the text, which are full of metaphors. The interesting thing is the metaphor is the body metaphor, you know. Uh, the, the headline of the, of the paper says the, the image belongs to all and it speaks by itself, you know. And uh, it, it, it really... I don't think I will have much time, so I will read it all to you, that it's in Spanish. But what actually matters is that the phrase that was repeated was Chile woke up. We are one body, we are just one body. And all the metaphors in people are like red cells, veins, are roads, the heart is what unites us. So it's all Chile has one main body, and, and it were, we were thousands, and really, it, it's very, very emotive. To read this, you read it and you feel like crying, you know. We are finally all together. We woke up of this, and in fact, the protest unveiled differences, although Piñera, the president, used to say that Chile were, was an oasis in Latin America, the best economy, etc. But many social differences were unveiled, and... Um, and well, injustices. And now they are talking about see how, what they can do about it. So the thing was, we are all together for justice, dignity, equality, respect, empathy, freedom, you know, freedom. Chile woke up. Uh, and, and again, we were like a body. We never got tired. We were breathing all together. And, and it was this that really circulated in most of the media. On all the symbols, of course, the statue, the Mapuche, etc. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't really 
uh, go in depth into it because it's it, uh, I, Johannes has told me that if I can uh, can sort of uh, um, stop for breaks, right? And also if I can do it shorter so we can have a discussion at the end. So if you like, we can stop here if there are any questions. And if not, I carry on because now I'm going to Venezuela and Venezuela will be much longer because it is many years. <laughs> it's not just one event, but it is the historical development following uh, change in emotions. Mm -hmm. You say, you decide. Yeah, no, I think it's good to make a question and then you have a time to breathe, take a water. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Right? yes. And uh, I don't know, we have a question and, and they, they ask about, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> change it here. Why is it I and you and not I and we? Because sometimes they do this to, to make like the part of it, to be inclusive, right? And uh -huh. make yes. sense, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. You may be inclusive and exclusive uh -huh. because in populist discourse, there is the you of the people with the, uh, with with you know, my small p, and the people with a capital P. So the people who are with me are you. The others are they. The others yeah. who are not with me are not you. So, I know, I'm a Brazilian and I know what, it, what this is me. <laughs> yes, you understand that very well. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the thing, it, it all goes to populist discourse. You know, populist right wing and left wing are very similar in many aspects. Okay, there may be ideological differences, but exactly the same. You can read Moffitt, for example. No Moffitt at the, uh, oh God, that's not Moffitt. Well, the, the people in Sweden or other people who've done it, myself, who have compared right wing and left wing, for example, and, and, and there are many, many things that are the same. You see, the, the, the emotional connection with the people, my people, the poor, okay? Yeah. And, and, and that relationship of fathers, father children, or, or the provider, the one who gives, you know, gives the present. And, and, and then the enemies, the, the adversaries, you know, those who are not with me, they are not my people. So they, and, and and they don't love the people. That's it. Okay. So yeah. it's 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 that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another question. That. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, as far as theoretical background, could you elaborate it on emotions and location in political space? Did you get it? Ah, emotion. Oh yes. Uh, oh yes. Yes. Uh, perhaps I didn't express it rightly. I mean, w w you you have emotions, and you can meaning that you get politically attached to some kind of perspective emotionally, because, for example, at home your family was, let's say, they were conservative, or they were Christian Democrats, or they were or belonged to the left, and so you by, by for an emotional reason, you sort of follow the same trend, you know. That is me now, okay, that means, or if you are against a dictatorship, well, then the, you, you do get emotions, you get negative emotions. But if you are for, for democracy or for socialists or whatever, then you do get, so, so there's always the chance of having positive or negative emotions attached to, well, to political perspectives. Yes. That is a location to locate you. I mean, to to find you a place in the political world. Let's say, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Michael, did you did you, would you like to to make a comment about what you said? Sorry, it took took me a second to find the button. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, I I was just you mean the, the the body politic. I was just wondering if 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 the body metaphors if they are universal. Because they, 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 they are very close to emotions, aren't they? We, we project our own body into, into the outer world. So I wonder if, that's, if that happens yes. in, 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 in most polities. Yes, it happens later, as you will see in Venezuela too. <laughs> yes, it's a body, you know. Venezuela, uh, emotions are um, physiological, as Maturana says. We're biological beings. I mean, we, 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 we mainly... Uh, and and this, uh, there is this argument whether emotions are individual, personal, or they can be shared. Yeah, they, they are personal. They are very personal. They may be shared. They may, they may be contagious or that. But person, first, basically, the, you are the only one who feels the emotion, either you share with others or not. Well, that is a long discussion, you know. <laughs> that is a long, long argument. <clears throat> 
Perfect. Uh, um, does anybody want to do any questions? Uh, we could move on. Shall I move on? Yeah, please. Okay, so we're going to move to Venezuela. You know, Venezuela has gone uh, from, uh, well, Chile suffered a dictatorship to went to democracy, okay? And, and, and in Chile, this outburst was against the, the, the democracy <laughs> that came after the dictate, after Pinochet's dictatorship. Venezuela lived in dictation, dictatorship, uh, but had a, a, had a democracy that lasted 40 years until things began to go badly. And there was a, a social outburst in 1989 that was called the Caracaso, uh, when for the first time in this new democracy, there was this uh, social explosion, people going to the street, there was a lot of looting, many people died. And it was like, you know, a, a warning, you know, what's going on, you know, things were deteriorating. Venezuela uh, is a very rich country, was a very rich country, an oil producer country. And, and it was very rich, but uh, corruption, a bad administration destroyed or gradually destroyed democracy. So this was the first sign that some things, a few things were going bad, okay? And then in 1992, there was a coup d'etat led by Hugo Chavez. August Chavez is well known all over the world now. And he gave this coup in 1992, was sent to jail, okay? Spent two years and created a part. And then uh, well, this is the coup, well, some of photos of the coup during Chavez. But then, thanks to the democracy, he ran for president and he was elected as president in 1998. So, but this moment is very important because it was, there was a rupture. There was a, a disruption. There was a disruption that was both political and emotional, I would say. The relationship between the participants in the political dialogue changed a lot, and also the politics changed. This was the beginning of a change from uh, a classical populism to an authoritarian military populism that exists now. And uh, one of the things that were done uh, with emotional, emotional purposes was to give a new meaning to this Caracaso. Uh, Chavez called it the day when the revolution is born. So the, there is this changing of history, permanent changing of history. So it was the initiation of the revolution back to 89. Okay. Uh, well, this is it, love for the people. I believe that in, in populist, uh, populist rhetoric, there is um, a strategy that I call love for the people because love is at the center of it all. Uh, this was this main slogan in Chavez campaign, Chavez Corazón de la Patria, he was the heart of the motherland. And so he himself was the center of this. So the metaphor, the theory, <laughs> the metaphor theory works very well, I think. And the people, of course, uh, followed him. Palante Chavez, corazón de mi patria, heart of my motherland. Okay. And uh, well, but not, not everything was great. I mean, for many years, okay, Chavez was um, really, he, he made an emotion, excellent. He was very successful in the connection with the people. And uh, well, then when he died, Nicolás Maduro took over and then many problems started. Uh, well, as you know, there have been massive migrations and uh, there is a legitimate cri legitimacy crisis because he's considered illegitimate. And then there is another president who is, according to the constitution, who, who would have the right to call for election, etc. So we are not going into that because that is very complex. What actually matters is how emotional and political destabilization took place. That is what I've been working on. What happened with the emotions and political change? Uh, according to social psychologists, when, when emotions, uh, obviously, uh, the confrontation was very bad. I mean, and, and it was done discursively. Uh, Chavez introduced a confrontational language. He, uh, he, when he swore, for, or as he took office, he swore on the constitution, but on the moribund constitution, so he violated rules, okay? Uh, political rules, uh, legal rules, etc. And so there was a lot of astonishment and expectations in 1999. 
and uh, he, he insulted people, he offended people. That was, you know, Trump is very much like Chavez, really. And that when you compare them, you can say, well, this is Chavez. I, I wonder if he learned from him, you know. And so it was a lot of, and then there were modern responses, explicit responses, hate was introduced, an intensification of verbal actions, etc. Well, this was, but then in politics, there was gradual desinstitutionalization of democracy. So democracy began to suffer with confrontational discourse, with polarization, and then we had the domination of only one party, controlled by fear, terror, controlled by hunger now, and now controlled by emotional exhaustion. This is what psychology, social psychologists say. This is how they see. So the now control, and the loss of the control of power is by is emotional. Okay. So what are the, the, the discursive strategies used? And this is what, these are the things that I'm interested in. Now, um, these emotions were used on purpose to produce effects. For example, to cause irritation. Chavez caused irritation in, a, in the population by, by violating cultural and political norms. For example, by doing things that are not proper for a, a government, a state, a head, you know, a head of state and things like that at the beginning and then obviously political norms then causing anger making people anger by insulting very well defined social actors the media by calling them liars or the church by calling them accomplices businessmen ladrones todos syndicates corrupt and traditional parties that were the rotten couples uh, they he called them rotten and then show anger so anger is like a strategy to show the force of your argument but direct insults to the enemies and then to humiliate people this has been seen mainly with maduro public exposure of enemies and show despise they're worth nothing actually chavez called his opponents la nada they are nothing okay so it is this how this affects the dialogue, the political dialogue. And this is very, very interesting. Okay. And then causing fear and terror, for example, by repression, military repression, taking the police military out after so many marches, now no marches, and then the collectives. These are these are uh, civilians that have been the armed civilians who terrorize the population. I mean, yeah. And then what we have massive emigration. How? Because people have reach some kind of hopelessness and sadness so emotions are are there are, are, i think they are strategically used and it's not just the use of emotions to produce certain behaviors but to produce patterns of political interaction i studied the function of insults with a lot of um, all this research i've done is data-based and corpus driven Okay, I work with great big corpus so then i identify patterns of, of, of political interaction we were, for example, initiated with, a, with an insult and responded by an insult and they closed by insult. Oh, that was fine. We were just insulting each other. But then there were a pattern to insults where, which had response with insults, but then they were closed with attacks, physical aggression to journalists. For example, Chavez attacked the journalists by calling them liars. And then the people on the streets called them liars and attacked their cars, broke their cameras, etc. Now they are taken to prison. Pattern three, initiation with insult, response with insult, or then they, they led to group affiliation. For example, newspapers. When he attacked a paper, okay, or a very well-known journalist, other papers aligned with the paper. And so this, this was generating, and it was very emotional, very emotional, because the attack was on the behavior, on the emotional behavior. And then there is a pattern which legitimized insults and violence. Uh, for example, the military, a military who attacked women, etc. And then he um, he was insulted. There were insults on both sides. But then the president decorated the military, and so this was the legitimation of violence and um, confrontation. Uh, from the presidency case. Okay, okay, so what I studied the emotional effects of the confrontation by doing surveys in universities, in, uni in several universities, asking them to remember insults 
uh, given to the president and the, pre the, the insult the president gave to the people. Obviously, the president in those days received more insults than any other president in this Venezuelan history. But the thing is that his insults came from power and they were remembered better. So there, all this emotional interaction had the effect of intensifying differences, racism, classism, sexism, intensification of hatred, increase of fear and despair, and it brought a lot of suffering. And, and so this has been mainly an emotional thing. Okay, so this emotional journey in Venezuela during 20 years, 14 years with Chavez, plus all the years we've had with Maduro, have gone from euphoria, euphoria, you know, we got to power, we are going to change the world to sadness. From hope, the hope to end with corruption, to end with injustice, to end with differences, to indignation and anger because this has not happened. And then, for example, in the case of Chile, we got from indig indignation to more anguish, to more stress, to more fear. This was a survey done in Chile. And in Venezuela now, what we've gone from hope to hopelessness. And this seems to be the rule. Okay. So, um, um, oops. Okay, well, just to close this, I just wanted to say that how important it is to look at emotions because in 1999, uh, we, as, as all colleagues from humanities and social sciences, produced a book right at the moment when Chavez was uh, becoming, you know, was just candidate to the elections. And we looked at it from different perspectives, psychology, sociology, um, communication, etc. And that gave us some insight. We predicted it was coming, but we analysts, uh, we <laughs> are not given much attention. And then later on, I focused on the particular political dialogue as dis uh, discourse as dialogue in Venezuela to see it historically, to see it from an interdisciplinary perspective, interactional and critical approach, which is different from, as I say, current critical discourse analysis is focuses mainly on representation, because I think dialogue is the most important thing for us. If we don't have dialogue, uh, there will be no peace in the world. There will be no future, really. That's, what I, that's why I do it. Now, that I very quickly, wow, very, very quickly, uh, of what I have to say about emotions in Venezuela. There is more, I've got lots of text, I've got lots of data. I've got, you know, Chavez is the president who spoke more than anybody else every Sunday for seven hours to the people in his program, Allo Presidente, I've got those. And well, all sorts of, now do you want me to carry on with Mexico because it's short? Um, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, good, good, I knew that. Okay. So I think it's good to stop. Uh, Johannes, can you do the question first, and then if uh, something change, uh, it's the sa similar with the questions. I don't know. Hi. Um, I think I would rather ask my question about appraisal theory at the end. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, uh, Professor. The first. Uh, talks about um, uh, discourses, disqualifying them. How can we reinvindicate re uh, this? Uh, are you listening to me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Uh, uh, because it shows a, a message that my connection was bad. Uh, how can we reinvindicate re 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 it? I don't know, this we have in Portuguese, but it's difficult. Uh, uh, this use uh, in uh, argumentative, argumentative disconstruction and Michael complement and he said that what is primary in political discourse argument the deliberation or emotion he said that Faircloth argued that narratives and imaginary are secondary to argumentation in the democracies so is that general you can generalize <laughs> You can't generalize, you know, you can never generalize. What should I, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't quite get the, what the point is. 
what's the point? Whether... So the first, the first one is, a, is the intensity ah, of emotions okay. expressed in, politi in politics, in political discourse, is proportional to gravity of the crisis which they think uh, takes place. Well, I, I don't know. Well, uh, argument is possible when there is dialogue, right? When the, if there is no dialogue, there is no argument. Uh, there are no de debates anymore. I have, I have some anecdote to tell you that I was invited to go, I, I like to go to Stockholm and meet my friends there. And I was invited to a meeting where we were going to discuss debate as a genre. And I said, I cannot go, I'm very sorry, I have no corpus. I, there are no debates in Venezuela. So there is a relationship between how far you can go with arguments. Yeah? Can you, you can argue in, when there is freedom when you are free to say what you think. And that, that is the thing, okay? Yeah. So of course, argumentation is limited or conditioned by the degree of dialogue there is, by the degree of freedom there is, how far you can go and who controls the dialogue, who controls the argument, okay? So if you are given only one position, there's nothing you can do, okay? You've got to align, but that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael, that's... could you would you like to to ask your oh, question? It's, <laughs> it's really linked to 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 what uh, Carolina said in in the in the um, in the chat. Her question was really emotions have been disqualified because they've been used in in um, demagogic or, or discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 her question was how can we uh, sort of use how can we come back to emotion? And I was just wondering that we have this focus in, in, in political discourse analysis on argumentation structures and, 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 and deliberation, at least in, in, in my area, um, where, where the emotion comes in there. And I think it's, it's, it seems to be to do with, with identity construction, doesn't it? If you, 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 yes. you, you yes. delineate us and them through, through, the, through the insults and through the emotion. Um, and that is somehow, well, we are actually back there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, I think, you know, I, want, I don't want to, oh, oh, to get in, in trouble, but I think we have to revise argumentation theories, you know. <laughs> I think we have to do a very, very profound revision of what kind of argumentation or how we are looking at argumentation. What is it? How we are teaching it at schools. We give them patterns. We say, this is the way you argue. And I don't think that's the way. We give them models. You follow this model, follow that model, but we don't really look at the way people actually argue. And I think that is important and that opens a line of research, you know, emotions and arguments. How, how do they, you know, the debate goes on, but I think emotions are, have to be given the major, most importance because we are emotional beings and this is being shown in the coronavirus. Nobody believes anything anymore because we are all, you know, scared to death. And so you don't believe the authorities, you don't believe the, 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 the experts, you don't believe anybody. And, and so the things that are going on in the world at the moment are mainly based on emotions. Look at, at the protests in the United States, uh, what's going on in the States now. And, and so I, I, I do think we have to, and there is plenty of, of, of theories. I mean, there is plenty of theoretical and methodological ways of doing it. Okay, so argument, and what we have to change is the way we look at arguments. That's, that's my point. <laughs> Thank you, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yes? Do we have another question, Prof Professor Bolivar? Yes, of course, go ahead. Marta Shiro, uh, sh she's asking, Adriana, do you think that the intensity of emotions expressed in political discourse is proportional to the gravity of the crisis in which it takes place? Oh, well, yes. Martha's questions are always uh, <laughs> good. Uh, well, yes, I, I think so. Yes, I think so. Because you can go from disliking something to hating something. And, and, and uh, you can go from causing fear to causing terror, you know, and, and to, yes, I think so. And, and so we have to be very careful with the sort of emotions, you know, are, 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 are being used or are being hmm, circulating, you know, the words we use to call them. 
Yes, there is a close relationship between the intensity of the emotion, the culture, the way emotions are approached in each culture. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, uh, the participants and the interaction, their roles, their responsibility, their degree of access, there are many, many variables. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can talk about it later. <laughs> and another question from uh, Encarnacion. Uh, she's asking, uh, you have mentioned uh, Martin and White's affect, and what's your view on this model? And the question is, similarities and difference between left and right populism in terms of remotion? Oh, that are two questions there. What that I was, think of a sorry, I don't, I don't know if I can interrupt you because I, I met him and said when I wrote it. So, well, thanks a lot for for the presentation, by the way, Adriana. So it was in terms of emotion. Sorry about that. Ah, okay. Intensity of emotion. No, no, no. I wanted to know first your view on the model by Martin and White, especially the concept affect. And second question was concerning the similarity and differences you could identify between left and right populism in terms of the use of emotion. Thank you. Oh, okay, so it's two questions. One is theoretical on the model. Well, uh, the model, I think it's, it's like a model, <laughs> like all models that was based on a particular type of data. I mean, it sprang from data. Uh, and so I think it, it is possible to extend the model. And I think that this is being done. This is being done. Oh, it's like a model. And um, I think it's been good in the sense that it's given semantic criteria for identifying effect in that sense. Although I believe that it needs to do more um, corpus linguistics <laughs> to sort of um, define the categories, a redefined category sometimes. And this is not only my criticism, but also, um, let's say, uh, Thompson himself, you know, Jeff Thompson himself, I said, did that. He said that sometimes the categories are blurred. You don't know how to identify one thing or the other, you know. And, uh, and, and it, that is a difficult point. But I think it's been good. At least that's the only system I use, the system of attitudes and affect. And I really am not, I don't do, I don't do appraisal theory, except for uh, the bit on affect, which I do not call affect. I call affectivity because I see it at the level of interaction. You can study affect only and in terms of texts, okay, and in terms of, of interaction. There is some very important point to be made theoretically, and it's how you interpret dialogue. What is dialogue? Uh, the influence of Bakhtin, and they are influenced by Bakhtin, has been enormous, enormous, okay? And I am... Sorry to say that this is only referred to me, only. Okay, it's not just Adriana saying it. But it's the actual dialogue, as it goes on in conversation, was not studied. In and along, you know, Bakhtin. It's a voices in the text. Ferkla says it himself. His definition of dialogue is Bakhtinian. Okay, so the definition in, in appraisal theory is Bakhtinian. So, well, it is restricted to that. If we, if we apply it in that way, it's fine. All models work as for the purposes they were built for. I mean, you, you cannot apply all models to everything. You know, you, you, it's, what, what was the purpose? Well, it was to study this, and this is it. All right. And the other reason, why, how are populist, uh, right and left wing populist similar? Emotionally they are, because they both have uh, 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 um, the, um, their own target people, that's the people, the people, the people that is with them, and then the others, the enemies. You know, if you compare, for example, Trump, Trump, compare Trump and Chavez, or Bolsonaro and Chavez, okay? They have their own group. That is their, their own group and, and all the love for that group but all the hate is for the other group that is their enemy. Okay. And so the, 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 the relationship is emotional. It, there is an emotional connection, no matter what. Okay, so I, I think so. Uh, read my book, uh, it's all explained there. And it's also in, um, in other books. It, I'm, I'm not the only one who says that. But it, it is important to see it, you know. And also it's not, right left, left wing the difference between right and left nowadays is so blurred what is right sometimes i'm reading news on 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 let's say on 
on Colombia. And I say, well, this may have been in, in, in Venezuela, or I'm reading something in Venezuela and say, oh, well, this was it in Brazil. You know, so the difference between right and left, that is another construct we have to study. What We cannot work with the same old categories. We've got to go ahead. That is my position. Okay, and we can go ahead as long as we study data, an enormous amount of data. We have to look at data. Okay, that's it. Information. Would you like to make your other question since you oh, already have oh, oh, for sure. Well, I'm very interested in emotion because I've been writing on emotion and populism, and I agree with the with Adriana on the on the mat on the issue that it is very silly just to distinguish between right and wing but i just simply oversimplify it just yes. for the purpose of uh, considering whether you have identified those um features that make them different or not so i do agree with so thank you very much for the answer so yeah um yes we get yes. in touch <laughs> no, no absolutely so i like that very much so i sent you by yourself uh, by by the way adriana i sent you in private um like a file that you might like reading later concerning affect and marginal white theory, just in case you might be interested in reading. Of course and, I will, yes, yes. Oh, lovely. So uh, my, my question was, um, well, the second one has to do with that, or the third one, I don't know. Um, let me see. Yeah. Do you want me to read? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you, I'm, so, I'm, I'm very okay. interested in their patterns. So, so Adriana, you've just discuss, they've been discussing the different patterns and then you, uh, when you said that, that some insults, right? So you said something like, you liars, right? So I understand that then you consider that, first of all, there is evaluation. So if we, if we use a Martin White theory, we should say that this liar is connected with a lack of propriety. So first of all, there's evaluation. Well, as uh, we can use the terminology or, or, or whatever. So first of all, the, uh, in this insult, when they, someone uses a politician or anyone else, uses these uh, insults, there's evaluation uh, for initially, cognitively speaking. So there's the, the description of the someone's behavior is something inappropriate based upon uh, social standards. Then we have this insult, which is, let's say, the expression that um, from which we can uh, infer or evaluation of that person's behavior. But at the same time, there's emotion, obviously. So, because as you said, this implicit, explicit, evoked, inscribed, etc., uh, different or attributed different features, etc. So, we have evaluation, we have insult, and then we have emotion. But is this emotion only the emotion that the politician feels, or it's the emotion as well that we expect um, um, uh, yeah. triggers someone's uh, reaction? So, the pe people's reaction. Because if I am not, if I I'm endorsing your views, right? If you are either left, <laughs> win, up, down, whatever term we are using here, right? So that emotion, uh, the emotion that the politician is feeling, uh, may, when we express it, may trigger a different reaction from the public, right? So, so exactly. I, I'd just like to, you to comment on that. Yes, uh, that possible. is a very important point. I've written a lot of insults. If you look at discourse on society, yeah. or discourse yeah, I know, I know, I know that, that, there, that, there are that's several articles on insults. I the know, insults know. Are, are very interesting because they are defined as such only uh, by the perlocutionary effect. So it's the one insulted who decides whether that's an insult or not. And, and so any word can become an, uh, can become an insult, any word. Actually, in a survey I made in 2000, what, or three, uh, I, I found out that there were 700 words that had become insults in, in Venezuelan Spanish mm -hmm. in one year. 700 words wow. that had a positive connotation. So then you see that words also change uh, their value. So they may be positive or they may be negative. And, and it's not on their own. Words do not change their value on their own. They change it because people change it, okay? The same as genres, you know, discourse genres change because people change them. For example, in Venezuela, the oath, you know, the oath, the, the, when you take uh, the, the oath as, as president, elect, the president-elect takes the oath, okay? Disappeared as a, as a discourse genre. It used to have, uh, 60 words, let's say, 60 words. I studied all, 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 the, all, the, all the oaths for several years. And then just an average of 60 words, it went about, about to 2,000, 8,000, because it was transformed into a, a, a meeting, a political meeting. So there were no oaths anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. No, 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 no need for that. This, the oath was done in the street with the people. The people say, do you accept the president? Oh, yes, we do. Okay, so, it, the people, so all the dynamics changed. So if the people change, the discourse genres change. So when we study, when, when we teach political law, or political genres, we've got to be aware of this dynamic change, you know, well, and that is evaluation. <laughs> All right. Okay, before I give the word to, to Johannes, I have a last question. Uh, why don't we use emotional attachments to pull people together rather than... <laughs> oh my dear, that is a very good question. Very good question, but because there is something that is called interest, economic interest. The world is moved by economic interest and economic powers, mm. not by our feelings, yeah. by our feelings. No, it's not feelings that move the world, it's money. And, and so <laughs> that is the main problem, okay? So the money. Yeah, he said, yeah. it continues, most populists use divide and concur strategy. Yes, yes, that is the yes. question. It, that's the yes. thing. That's the thing. Yes, yeah. divide. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Professor Miller. Well, the coronavirus has felt in Mexico or not? Uh, just Ingrid Miller have a question and then we can move on. So. Um, I think we'll discuss the question after um, the talk. Okay. And uh, go well, ahead. I can tell you, you tell me when to stop because I, for, I'm not looking at the watch. Well, we have time. We, um, I would suggest if, if you maybe wrap up in the next 10 minutes, um, we have until about um, 5.30. Well, and it's we 11 o'clock for me. What is, it? What is 5.30? But um, now it's 5.5. Five. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so we've have got 20 minutes. minutes. Okay, yeah. so yeah. if you let me finish, you let me finish to show you Mexico now. Perfect. Because uh, I have to be, I mean... I'm just beginning with Mexico, and actually, as, as I'm a foreigner in this country, I'm not allowed to, to participate in politics, but I can do emotions. Okay. I can do emotions, and I began looking at them to see if I found similar patterns with other countries. You know. And indeed there are, but there are also very important differences, and I think it's, it's, it's good, at least, to have that in mind. Okay. So uh, this is the president, uh, President uh, AMLO, uh, um, López Obrador, he, he took office uh, about a year and a half ago uh, after, uh, I mean, he, he, he received a country not in very good conditions. I mean, you know, levels, high levels of violence, corruption, wow, uh, drug cartels, etc., etc. Uh, but, okay, he introduced a great change in what I call the macro dialogue. It's a new cycle in, in, in Mexican politics, okay? He initiates a new cycle is his party, Movement to National Renovation. No? La Esperanza de México, Mexico's hope. This is how all, all, all politicians start, with hope, you know? There is hope everywhere. Uh, La Esperanza de México. And this is a project of radical change, economic and moral change. And this is interesting because love for the people is a moral strategy. And, again, and, and most strategies are moral and they do not, you know, materialize in, 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 do, in, in sort of programs, for example. Well, anyway, he is for the fourth transformation, which mm, several projects, very interesting projects, and uh, he's just beginning. But he, he is the eye on the people and he uses the love for the people and the ask on them difference too. I mean, this is clear, this is clear. And uh, obviously, he amor por el pueblo, and some, some of his, the words he's used resonate with Chavez when he said, for example, uh, I, I do not, uh, ya no, yo no pertenezco a mí mismo, I do not belong to myself, I belong to the people. That was said by Chavez years ago, and these words were repeated by him. So I love you, you love me, uh, and, and you know, and, and this relationship in all populism government creates, ah, creates gratefulness because people are grateful that they are loved and then that brings loyalty. So I vote for you. So it, it is a sequence, it's a sequence. And I'm looking at this. It's only just looking, okay? Just beginning to. And with the coronavirus, uh, something uh, very interesting has happened. Now before that, I went to the emotion research lab. You know, there is an emotion research lab in Spain. 
that analyzes facial expression. Again, going back to Charles Darwin. And he said that after uh, the, the election, um, AMLO's election was an emotional process, really an emotional process, because as, as was in Venezuela, as it's been in other places, where people had had enough, they are frustrated, they're angry, they want something different. And AMLO offered change and hope, but he also used my facial expressions, he and other people, other, other emotions, fear, alegría, happiness. He projected happiness. Orgullo, pride, euphoria, sympathy, uh, trust, confianza, optimism. In fact, this is one of the things that in, really impresses me most here in Mexico, that people are so optimistic. We are coming out of this. We are good. We are brave. We've gone through so many difficulties. And we're going to come out of this. This is very interesting. The ecstasy, you know, and admiration. So this is very, very, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to go so quick but this is it you can look for emotion research lab and find all sorts of analysis that are very very Professor? problem has oh, sorry. been has sorry. gone through state not very lucky very yes no uh, no no it, it was a there was a a, um, a pause sorry. Yes, it says yeah. something about my internet not being good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But... Okay, he made, at the beginning, he made some comments that actually reached the entire world and he was criticized. I saw some headlights in Germany, for example, criticizing him because the first thing he said is, no pasa nada, nothing is going on, there's nothing. But no pasa nada is just an expression in the Mexican culture, which is to give you support. You know, when someone is ill, you say, oh, no pasa nada. No, 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 just, just, you know, keep calm. It's equivalent to keep calm. And you can hug. That's what he says. But he was really minimizing fear. And I think that was his point. Okay. <clears throat> but then he did something that nobody liked. That he said that the coronavirus had come to him like a glove. Como anillo al dedo. For his transformation which somewhat, somehow created fear for more control from the government, okay? Then there was this response with criticism for the late reaction, lack of empathy and solidarity, many journalists. And so he reinitiated and he said, this is serious, trust the experts, one cannot force you, it's your responsibility. So he put his, puts a responsibility on the people, you are responsible for what you do with your life. Okay, and this is the expert, Hugo lopez Gatel. He keeps daily contact with the people. What I forgot to say, that AMLO, or this is a mañanera, he has morning conferences every day to talk with the people. So he, he keeps direct contact with the press and the people. And he uses this, of course, to make comments on the criticism he receives and he answers back, and also to talk about his program, you know, the projects. So, <clears throat> the expert is, is an excellent expert. I, I quite like and enjoy his evening conferences. He, I, I thought of the validity claims that Johanna spoke about the, uh, the last time, right? Validity claims. So we have here two types of claims. The validity claims that come from science and the validity claims that come from the president who was you know, mainly on his good, his kindness, his love for the people and who do you believe? So it's a problem of believing. Do you believe the president or do you believe the experts? And, and so it, it is also politically, you know, <laughs> uh, somehow it is, uh, politics has to do with it, okay. Now, what do we have in terms of emotions during COVID? Uh, here they talk about emotion pandemia. This was <laughs> the university, the UNAM, the, the biggest university, reported in April the 4th. than 50 types of emotions, nine, and the main ones were fear, sadness, and anger. They seem to be common to every, everywhere. This is interesting. Fear, sadness, and anger. And there has been, I will, when I focused on anger only, you can see an increase of violence. Yeah, April 29, 
there were 47 cases of attacks to medical staff working with COVID, mainly in Jalisco. These was, were reported in at least 22 states out of 32 states. And they said, why are they attacking medical staff? You know, uh, nurses, 80% of the cases are nurses and doctors. Well, it's fear of death. That's what they say. But what do they do? They throw them disinfectants, deny access to public transport. They have received death threats at gunpoint and very few detentions. So impunity, there is impunity. So, so we have this violence and impunity going on, you know. And then this gets worse with damage to infrastructures. It's not that violence against persons, that it's a violence about structures. And this is how I'm going to cross. Then violence increases even more. Third of June, what we find is policemen kill men for not wearing mouth masks. So we go to stream. I, you know, either you do what you think you can do, or the police in a state which this Alfaro person is the governor, presumably very authoritarian. And so they killed a guy who was on the street without a mask, took him to prison, tortured him, and he was killed. This, of course, has created, imagine, oh God, uh, great <laughs> interchanges of all sorts for authoritarianism, excesses, for fear, for more anger, and uh, but central government condemns attacks, and that is good, okay? Now, the latest news, 11th of June, they destroy a hospital. Habitantes de Chiapas destrozan hospital, they queman ambulancia y agreden a personal médico. So, here you are. Uh, so, this is creating violence, and this is something I want to study more in depth and collect data, yes, analyze all the news, because there are some fake news as well, not to favor the government, uh, or, or, or fake news to, to, you know, against the, op the opponent. So this is very important. So all this is obviously the media, the media have a main role in, in not only presenting emotions, but in interpreting emotions, in attributing emotions, okay? And in actually, after given a representation of what, you know, the, the, the dialogue between the president and the people is like, and what is actually going on. When so, uh, what I have to say, just I promise to say, the, to talk about emotions and ideology in times of political change. And I believe that I've shown that emotions are used for ideological purposes. Is that right? Yes, they are. <laughs> And I think we can learn more about their functions in political interaction by studying how they work in different political cultures. So it's not the same to study emotions in, in, in Chile, where people are going to psychiatrists, for example, and psychologists, and this is reported by the universities, how many people need support for mental health. And I suppose Argentina is very much like that. They like psychologists, right? But it's not uh, people in Venezuela do not go to psychologists, it's just, just wait and suffer. And here, you know, in Mexico, it is also different. I, I know that the universities and psychologists and psychiatrists are advising, you know, people should go, should learn how to control their emotions. But of course, the problems are deeper than that. And I think that political change brings disruptions. And these are discursively and emotionally constructed by the participants in the political dialogue. In my book, I say that political interaction has to take into account everybody, not just the main leaders, not just opponents and, and, and you know, leaders and opponents or whatever, but mainly all the people. So here, this is where culture comes in because we've got to study what the people on the streets are doing. So we've got to, you know, there's a lot of work ahead, I think. This is it. Uh, and there are lots of references, you can see, references, 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 references. <laughs> and that's all for today. I'll be very happy to have questions and take notes so I can carry on with this. Yeah. We have Thank you. Um, I think up, there is a question. Uh, just a second, uh, Professor uh, Johannes, could you talk? Uh, I have a problem, I, 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 an issue here with the, my, my equipment. Sorry. Okay, maybe I can come up with a question I had. 
Okay. It's a rather general one, and it uh, links up with a question about uh, appraisal theory. Um, the question I would have um, is, I mean, I understand that the project uh, that uh, you presented is um, is quite an eclectic one that it draws from many different sources, not just from from um, uh, from appraisal theory, uh, yes. which I think makes total totally sense. Um, okay. I mean, as a general question, I mean, what I see in appraisal theory is that there's a tendency to see some sort of um, reflection or correspondence between the world of social practices and also of inner states within the speakers and the, mm -hmm. the forms that they use, um, the linguistic forms. And, mm -hmm. um, and in a way, the ling linguistic forms, expressions, um, they, um, they represent, um, well, the functions, the stuff that people want to do with, uh, uh, yeah. with language. And so there's a tendency to see that kind of um, um, correspondence between a certain type of word or set of words, um, um, a, a sort of um, apparatus of, of linguistic uh, expressions yeah. and, uh, and a certain function, let's express affect, uh, emotions or whatever, yes. right? And, um, and um, I mean, I'm always puzzled to see that idea because um, of course, I mean, you just have a very quick look at whatever material and you see you don't have correspondence. Mm. And uh, you can use whatever words for so many different things. And it's almost uh, too, too much so that you can really see that kind of direct link. So if, if you want to um, study, for example, a corpus, um, if you have um, a certain selection of text, how do you link them back to um, to the states of emotion um, which you want to, to study, um, the states of emotion in the community, for example. And um, given that probably there are lots of very, very different um, ways to express those emotions. Yeah. Well, I think that appraisal theory uh, is open, really, is open. You know, it's not a closed set of, of, of categories. It, it's closed in the sense that it offers some categories, but it, they, this can be open to further analysis, and that, that is important. And I think that we can work on that direction, you know, how to, how to extend the system, or access the model, the model, okay? And um, it, it's true, what you say is absolutely true. I mean, it's interesting in the forms. Okay, but you can access from other <laughs> perspectives as well, you know. My, 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 the way I view evaluation is more in the Labovian sense, you know. I, I, my, I was influenced by Labov, by Grimes, a lot by Grimes, and, uh, and then by the Birmingham School people, you know. Uh, Eugene Winter, who studied evaluation in text, Mike Hoey, and, and this is why I, I you know, focused on evaluation that I called in text and in life. I make the distinction. So the distinction is that when you look at evaluation in the text, you can find references inside the text to, 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 to evaluate and say, this is one type of evaluation. But the problem is what, what evaluation does? What do you evaluate? What do you evaluate in the text? Do you evaluate something in the text? That, a preceding, a preceding uh, proposition, for example, a proposition, or, or what? Or are you pre uh, evaluating things outside? You know, th that is, that is as the problem. What in political discourse, for example, what are you evaluating? Well, I, I evaluate the quality of the dialogue in a democracy. To me, uh, dialogue is fundamental to to assess the quality of democratic dialogue. Is it democratic or not? So you must have parameters as. Uh, uh, Jeff Thompson does that. So you, you can, you, just forms are not enough. I mean, it's very good. It's the same as we do with syntax. We do need syntax, or we, knew, we do need grammar. Yeah? We do need grammar to know the difference between vocabulary, okay, and structures. Okay? We do need the meta functions, what we do with grammar, but we also need other things. Yeah? That, that, that's the main point. So we need the forms, but we need, we need to see how these forms interact in, 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 in social context, how they are used by the, by the persons. So my focus, I do not start with models. The first thing I say to my students is, do not think of a model, think of a problem. What you have to have is a problem, a research problem and a hypothesis. I mean, your view, what you think, or, or your intuition, at least your intuition. 
And then you go and look for the options you have. Appraisal theory is one option, which is very good for one thing, for some things, okay, but not very good for others. Okay? So then you either use what you need or expand it. That's it. One of our students at the doctorate expanded it, actually, Nora Kaplan. She wrote an article and, and so she, 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 in her PhD thesis, and she, she, she did. And other people are doing exactly the same. Actually, an article of mine is coming out soon in Mexico where I talk about, <laughs> about uh, neo Neo-Ferrosian linguistics. Well, uh, but it, it, I think it's, the, the, it's, it's that. Not just think of the model, think of the problem. So what is the problem we have now in political communication, in political interaction? We do have a problem with emotions. So what are we going to do? How are we going to approach emotions? Repressal theory, not enough, okay? Uh, whatever theory. Uh, Van Dijk's theory, not enough. Ferkloff theory, not enough. So what are we going to do? We have to, to, to choose our own categories for the problem we decide to uh, analyze. That is the way I see research. And of course, we have to collect data. We cannot do it just because we think things are like that. You know, our data is fundamental. Um, there's a one question. And then if, if we have time, I'll give the word for Professor Rosina because she wants to have a question. Okay, so first is from Mariana. Uh, how would you just justify the fact that Chilean crisis was considered more closely related to, to emotions and the Venezuela crisis was not, or not as much? Oh, well, because it was a moment. I think it was a moment. Also, there is something that is called expectations, okay? Uh, Chile, the Chilean government had created expectations all over Latin America and all over the world that it was a solid democracy, that it was very well economically, that it was a oasis, the best place to live. And many, actually many Venezuelans went, emigrated to Chile, and now they're coming back. And, and, and then uh, you see oh, these expectations. And then when, when, when the protest started, nobody could believe it. Nobody could believe it. How come? Actually, I phoned friends and family in Chile and I said, what do you think? And the first reaction was, no, we agree with this because Chile, it, 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 what we had it, is a lie. It's not true. I mean, the middle class is really up to their neck with debts and the, the, the health system doesn't work. Pensions are very low. Private education over public education. And, and so there were so many complaints. Then as the violent protest started, people began to, you know, to react differently. They didn't like it that much. But the first reaction was emotional and in the sense that we are angry. It was anger. Anger against a system that was hiding inequalities, that was hiding you know, injustices. I think that is why. While Venezuela at that moment had been going on <laughs> through that for a very long time, you know. Yeah. So it, 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 I think it was that, the moment, the critical moment, the expectations people had about Chile. Yeah. That's the reason I think. Perfect. Uh, Professor Rosina, do you want to make a question? All right, yes, thank you for that, Lillian. You're welcome. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, for your talk, um, much appreciate, really interesting as usual with all your talks and we, we learn so much, well I certainly do. And, um, and I sort of wanted, I mean, I'm not too sure that comments or something, but just to, to touch up on a couple of things. One is the IU distinction which you make. And I totally align with what you say in terms of populism in Latin America and how they do it, the actual practices in how they do it. And we not only see this in the actual, in actual the political discourse, in the genre of political discourse, but you also see it very clearly in the discourse of soap operas, where they, you have the I and U and the paternalistic point of view, you know, both mm -hmm. in Venezuela. I'm not sure about Chilean soap operas. I'm, I'm not sure I never got hooked onto those. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so so you can actually see that there. But I, I wanted to really to dwell a little bit on emotion, right? And when you showed us the image, the powerful image in of Chile, you know, with the Mapuche flag at the very top, right? Um, it is precisely that emotion of seeing that uh, you finally have reached established common ground with other people in your nation that brings you together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know. 
um, how that allows people, you know, to, to, to interstitially position themselves as part of the you when they have never been part of the you, right? Mm -hmm. They will not be part of that you. And this is an ephemeral moment as history has shown us. Yeah. So that Mapuche flag is not part of the, new, of the you, but through the no. evolution, they reach that common ground, right? For a moment, there's a common perspective. But how can we dwell on how the reaction to emotion is taken, right? Assessed by the actual participants who form the you for a moment, for a trans ephemeral moment, a couple of hours, days, weeks, and they get reconstituted back into others who are not part of the I or the you. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes, very interesting. I think it's very interesting. I haven't thought of that ephemeral thing. I, I believe that it, that is very important, very important to take into account, yes. But when yes. I do the I and the you, I, 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 I am looking at it from a different perspective, I think, uh, mainly from a political perspective, a historical perspective because of personalism. Do you know that our, in Latin America, uh, our politics is characterized by personalism, personalism. This has been studied by historians. I mean, we've had caudillos. We have a history of caudillos after Simon Bolivar, you know, caudillos. And, and democracies have, have always been very weak. And there's always a danger of having a military coup. And there are, there are so, there've been so many dictatorships in Latin America. So the focus on the personal is far more stronger than perhaps in other regions of the world. So we are highly personalistic. And so the eye of, of, the, of, of the people who control power is very, very important. And obviously the you is those who are with me. Uh, and, and I studied this through uh, there is an article of mine on, on pronouns which circulates in Academia Edu. Uh, I took all, all, all the, I mean, this is in, in presidential, presidential uh, speeches in different, uh, in different um, times, studying how they used uh, I and you. And during the democracy, for example, when, when speeches were written to be read, they didn't use the I. They didn't use the I. But when things change, let's say they used the explicit I only once right, uh, the, the, in the democracy. When Charles arrived, he used uh, I 90 times. So there was a different relationship the, the, with the people. Now, the, so, the, so I did a quantitative analysis and also qualitative analysis to see what happens when you use I and you. So it is important to look at it because it is associated with populism, definitely, and with personalistic and authoritarian governments. Now, uh, it is important to say, now, this is, uh, there's so much to study, really, so much to study. But the you is important because, you see, as, as you very well said, it can be inclusive and exclusive. It, it's never inclusive, you know, totally inclusive. And the same, you know. And the eye, and the eye has the property that is one of these shifters, you know, as shifters, that it can mean I, you, we. The eye has the power to be all the other pronouns. For example, uh, the president speaking, and in, in, in reporter's speech, he says, they asked me, are you going to change? The you becomes I. The we becomes I. So the one who uses the I is the one who has more power in the discourse. Okay, that, well, that's interesting. Thank oh, you, oh, there's something I oh, wanted sorry. to mention. There's something I, I need to mention. I've just finished writing uh, with with a Spanish with a colleague from Spain. We just finished writing a chapter called uh, uh, Politi uh, uh, "Politics and Discourse Studies." And one of the differences we make is between studying political discourse and another one which is studying or doing political analysis of discourse. It's two things that we as discourse analysts must have in mind. So if we do discourse analysis, political discourse analysis, okay, we study the language and we study the strategies and we study the discourse genres within the field of politics. But if we do political discourse analysis, then we are concerned with other, oh, other things, L like, like law, for example. I mean, what, what's the meaning of democracy? 
you know, what's the meaning of democracy? What's the meaning? So we go into politics. So really working with as discourse analyst is very complicated because you do have a position, uh, from, you do have a political perspective, you cannot deny that. But at the same time, you do have a commitment uh, uh, as a researcher. You have to do research well. I mean, you, you, you see, and this is why sometimes critical discourse analysis was criticized in the past because it was too politically you know, committed. While now I think that uh, political discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis are really doing it based on, on data. And, and you see, for example, Ruth Wodak works. I mean, she uses triangulation and, and advises this. I mean, you have to use several methods in order to explain the same problem. You cannot approach it only from one perspective. And, and, and this is very important. Mm -hmm. Well. Thank you very much for, for your questions. I have taken notes and I think they're very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think we, we, we are uh, out of time. <laughs> um, we could talk about this for a long time. We have yes. so many <laughs> examples. Uh, every time we talk about something, I remember, oh, this is happening in Brazil. Oh, this is, oh, I can, I can see this happening. So I think. Yes, uh, we should study the, you know, parallel developments, you know. Yeah. And what makes a difference? What makes it? Bolsonaro is very interesting as a subject of study. Yes, I mean, of course. Very, very interesting, you know. And I think now the tendency is to compare Trump with our Latin American leaders. And that is very interesting. Yes, yeah. I, I, on my myself, I myself compared uh, Trump's uh, speech uh, with, with Chavez, you know, to look for signals of populism. And, and it was interesting, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. And, uh, yeah, no. his, insults, his insults are recorded, you know, they are database. As, as Chavez insults were recorded and, and so you've got a database for, of, of insults and offenses. So it's interesting, very interesting. Yeah. Well, very much. Just, just remember uh, that this lecture will be available in the DiscourseNet channel in YouTube. Uh, oh. Probably to, today or tomorrow. Oh. oh. So I can see myself. No, I never see myself. Yes. Yes, I can <laughs> see. Oh, terrible. <laughs> terrible. Perfect. Professor Perfect. Johannes, do you want to say something? Well, thanks so much. Um, this was really a great um, experience together. I mean, in these very unusual times. And um, <clears throat> I mean, we are all struggling with these emotions uh, in a very real sense, I guess. Yes. And we are. Um, so I think your work really comes very timely. Thank you so much, Adriana, for that. Thank you for inviting me. I've had a very good time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll keep in touch through mail. Okay. Yep. See you bye. soon. See you. Thank, Thank you, you again. You. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Ah.